Thank you all. Um, I think you can hear me now. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, uh, to be here with you and an honor to be here. Um, I, I gave the first of these Harper lectures a couple of weeks ago in Mexico City, and it was a lot more fun than I anticipated it. And, um, <laughs> and uh, with the, what I hear is a rowdy DC crowd, it should be even more fun. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to speak for a few minutes. For uh, I've been told we have about an hour total, so, but I won't speak for an hour. Uh, that would be cruel after all the alcohol. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk for maybe you know, 40 minutes or 45 or whatever you want, something in that area. And then uh, we'll open it up and have a conversation. And then hopefully the alcohol will make the questions even more interesting than they otherwise already would have been. So um, the, the title, and I, yeah, this works. Um, it's simple. Urban ghettos are some cities more punishing than others. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my work as a scholar. I'm a professor of sociology. And it's, it's work that, as it turns out, has a lot to do with the history of sociological work on cities at the University of Chicago. And then I'm going to talk a little bit at the very, very end about what kinds of thinking, uh, uh, new thinking we need around the issues I'm going to talk about. Uh, to be a little less cryptic, I'm going to ask a very simple question in this talk, which is, um, for people who live in, uh, in poor neighborhoods, and this is what I mean by ghettos, basically neighborhoods that have a high poverty rate, and if you want to get more technical, most people use the cutoff of 30% or more, some people use 40% or more for extreme high poverty neighborhoods, okay? Um, and the question is, uh, if you live in a neighborhood of this kind, uh, how tough is life for you? And by tough, I know that's not exactly a technical term, uh, the question is really how hard is it to access the things that everybody would want to access regardless of what neighborhood they lived in and regardless of what income they, want, they, uh, they, they lived under. And um, what I'm going to argue is that we've answered this question the wrong way. And that we've answered this question the wrong way in part because we've done the right thing, which has gone into the neighborhoods actually often of Chicago, but we've interpreted the wrong things from those neighborhoods. I'll show you what I mean in a second. So the research question is pretty simple. How does the concentration of poverty, that's what I mean by concentration there, affect experience? And the idea of concentration stems from a pretty simple hypothesis. Some of you might have been uh, at the University of Chicago when William Julius Wilson, a very influential sociologist, was there. And Wilson, in his book in 1987, and I'll talk about it in a second, uh, proposed a very simple idea, which is that um, living in a high poverty neighborhood, independent of your own poverty level, is going to affect your life chances. Okay, and that was it. Turns out that testing that is very hard. Uh, testing that it's the neighborhood you live in as opposed to your income level that's having an impact on your life, and as opposed to, of course, a bunch of other things. Uh, but it's actually an important and very powerful hypothesis that structured how a lot of us, including a lot of us in policy, thought about poor neighborhoods. Um, what I'm gonna show you, and this is the second line there, that there's been a dominant view, and that view is, in fact, William Julius Wilson's, who was one of my dissertation advisors, uh, that begins with the macro. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. It begins with the big picture. And from the macro, it narrows down into what's happening in neighborhoods. And I'm, what I'm going to suggest is that in doing so, we've made some mistakes. And that if we begin from the macro, begin from the ground, from people's everyday experiences, we're actually going to generate different kinds of answers about that question that are going to tell us actually some of the flaws in the core theory. So this is a friendly critique of a broad perspective that originated at the University of Chicago from somebody at the University of Chicago who was a student of one of the people who made that critique important, that theory important. Then I'm gonna briefly show you some data. Um, I'm not gonna show you any regressions, uh, thankfully for I'm sure many of you, uh, but I'll show you enough data so that you can tell that I'm not just making it all up. <laughs> and finally, what I'm gonna suggest is that because of what you're gonna learn, we need different ways of thinking about social science today if we wanna understand cities properly. Okay. Um, the ghettos, Chicago and elsewhere. First question, how does concentrated poverty affect everyday experience? The answer, here's the punchline in case uh, you gotta go early. It depends far more on what city we're talking about than we have acknowledged. And therefore, we need a new set of questions. What do I mean by that? The dominant view is the view that I began discussing a little bit uh, ago. Uh, William Julius Wilson in the blue book there is a tool disadvantage. It came out in 1987 when he was, he was at the University of Chicago. And also, a little bit less, but also in a book, uh, When Work Disappears, that was published in 1996, the year he moved to Harvard. And in that book, he argued essentially uh, that the way to understand what was happening in America's inner city ghettos was to understand the big picture of the United States economy as a whole. And he said, basically what's happening is there's a set of structural conditions that are taking place in the country. 
in cities, the manufacturing sector is becoming less and less and less important to economies. This is something that began, according to Wilson, in the 1970s. So factory jobs that low-skilled workers could acquire in cities pretty easily started disappearing from cities, going to the suburbs where land was cheaper, and actually often to other countries. And as a result, a lot of very easy to get jobs started disappearing from the central city, and people who were low-skilled were having a harder time finding jobs. In addition, he said in part because of the many successes of the civil rights movements, and also other large um, secular trends, such as the migration of the middle class from the central cities to the suburbs, what happened is that in poor neighborhoods, or in neighborhoods that were formerly, I should say, not necessarily poor, but predominantly African American, what we used to think of as ghettos, there used to be, Wilson would argue, um, a mix of middle income and low income people. So there were low income people and people who could barely make ends meet and people with sixth grade education, but there were also teachers and doctors and lawyers. After the civil rights movement, the teachers, doctors, and lawyers started moving to the suburbs along with everybody else. And what was left in the neighborhoods were a high concentration of poor people who, on top of it, had a harder time in a low skill state finding jobs because those easy to get jobs in the manufacturing sector were also disappearing from the city. That is the idea. And so what he, what he argued then is that, and that's what this, at the meso level, that as a result of these secular changes, there were the conditions in neighborhoods and inner cities changed so that con the concentration of poverty increased. And that concentration of poverty led to, at the bottom, many of the difficulties that people experience in low-income neighborhoods and what we associate with uh, poor neighborhoods. Um, low well-being, low mobility, a difficulty accessing, uh, having access to good resources, uh, deinstitutionalization. This was a term that was thrown about a lot in Chicago in the 1980s and 1990s. This was the idea that you couldn't find everyday resources, grocery stores, pharmacies, and so on, in high poverty neighborhood because the middle class left took its leadership, its entrepreneurship, and its dollars. It's a very powerful idea. What's interesting about this idea, and the idea has been critiqued and refined and so on by many people who followed, it was derived by research in the city of Chicago. So William Julius Wilson was at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park, for many, 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 I think 25 years or something. Some of you might know better than I would. Um, later, Douglas Massey came to Chicago and advanced a very popular critique of Wilson's work, but also based on what he saw in the poor neighborhoods in Chicago. After that, Robert Sampson was also a very senior University of Chicago researcher who years later actually went and joined uh, uh, Bill Wilson at Harvard in about 2002. Did a lot of heavy work at the University of Chicago, including the very major project called the Project on Human Development in the Chicago Neighborhoods. This is the project that made Rob famous. Uh, Loic Vacant, one of uh, probably Wilson's most famous student in the West Coast, uh, did a study studying some of the ghetto neighborhoods, some of the ghetto parts of Woodlawn, literally even a, an old gym. He, he, his, one of his first books was on a boxing gym in Woodlawn. Uh, literally, I mean, the, the students would just go right down the street. Um, Sudhir Venkatesh, you might recognize him. He's the guy in Freakonomics who found out about the drug dealers. He wrote a book, uh, something about being a gang leader, you know, this thing. Um, <laughs> right, the gang, the gang leader for a day, thank you. Gang leader for a day. Uh, he studied the Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago and then continued doing research in many of the neighborhoods in the west and south side. Uh, you're going to see in a minute why I'm taking my time here. Uh, Mesner and Rosenfeld, very important criminologists who've written a lot about, of course, the relationship between neighborhood poverty and crime, also did a lot of their major work in Chicago. It turns out that in part because Chicago has a, had such a distinguished history of studying um, the city, period, the study of concentrated poverty also grew, attracted graduate students and attracted faculty to Chicago, who in turn went to their own backyard, literally got into their cars and drove to Woodlawn and drove to the south side and got into the west side to study the concentration of poverty. What they argued, and what Wilson and others argued very explicitly, is that this concentration of poverty had a couple of very concrete impacts. First was social isolation. This was a term that was thrown about a lot. The idea was in this neighborhood, as you can imagine, right, middle class leaves, what you see is young people who don't see any lawyers, don't see any doctors, don't see any, right? And what they see is criminals and so on. And so they're isolated. People are isolated uh, from mainstream America. Uh, a great deal of violence. Uh, we've heard a lot about that, and we were talking earlier, that's still an uh, important part of the narrative. And also, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time um, talking about this one because there's tons of data, um, low access. Uh, meaning a low level of organizational density. 
grocery stores, convenience stores, pharmacy. You can't remember the phrase food deserts, right? You can't find fresh food. This idea was actually very powerful. The food deserts idea actually was also popularized in Chicago. And so the idea that emerged was high concentrated poverty results, among other things, in low organizational density. And it's a very powerful idea that actually informed even how I've thought about poor neighborhoods. And here's some evidence, just so you don't think I'm sort of making this up. Uh, here's Wilson, um, who, who writes about the low organizational density in neighborhoods with high concentration of poverty. He says, poverty in gated neighborhoods has sapped the vitality of local businesses and other institutions. There are fewer movie theaters, bowling alleys, restaurants, parks and playgrounds, other recreational facilities. We've all heard some version of that. Here are Rosenfeld and Mesner, who in a very popular and widely used textbook are citing a police officer who's describing a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. And the police officer says, look, do you see any hardware stores? Do you see any grocery stores? Do you see any restaurants, any bowling alleys? There's nothing here. Everything we take for granted, a laundromat, a cleaners, anything, it's not here. Again, the picture is of these decimated neighborhoods. And depending on the time that you lived in, the, in Hyde Park, if you walked literally three blocks south, two blocks south, uh, from the law school, one block south, uh, into the neighborhood, right? <laughs> into some of the neighborhoods, right there, the same thing that scholars, you would see exactly, I think, the same thing. It was a very powerful picture. But I didn't go to graduate school in Chicago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went to graduate school in the East Coast. I know. Hey, but I teach there now. Um, <laughs> I was told about the DC crowd. Um, I teach. <laughs> um, and I said, you know, um, what happens if you, instead of beginning from the macro picture, you just start on the ground? Just go to those neighborhoods, right? So Bill described a very vivid picture, and he described it to me and others when I was in graduate school. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is what poor neighborhoods look like. Well, I'm going to start going to some poor neighborhoods and see what I see. And the question is, if I'm thinking of, remember, the question of access, if I'm living in a high poverty neighborhood, how difficult is it for me to access the things that everybody would want to access? A laundromat, a grocery store, the things you said about in a minute. How hard would it be? And then, and then I go to a neighborhood, and then I look at what's there, and then I go to another, another neighborhood, and then I go to another one and another one. In other words, I begin from the micro, and I expand outward, as opposed to beginning from the macro and inferring about what's happening. If you've taken philosophy, you'll recognize that the parallel between deductive thinking and inductive thinking. Just as a thought experiment. And then you reevaluate. Well, here's what I did. So I remembered a very vivid passage from Bill Wilson from the very, his classic book, The Tool of Disadvantaged, which incidentally is one of the most cited books in social science, certainly in sociology, but in social science as a whole. And in fact, I think it's the book that got him the National Medal of Science and so on. And Wilson argued, many of the central arguments of the Tool of Disadvantaged were, this is the book, were inspired by my travels to inner city neighborhoods in the city of Chicago over the past several years. So I moved to Chicago uh, in 2006. I said, okay, um, I can get in my car too, and I'm gonna go to the <laughs> south side of Chicago and see what I see. So I did. I went to Woodlawn. Woodlawn, as all of you or most of you know, is the neighborhood that's directly south of Hyde Park. And if you go to Woodlawn, this is what you see. And what I love about this picture is that the desolation and the isolation and the emptiness is actually quite clear. Um, here's another shot, and this is actually one of my favorites. It might not seem like it doesn't say anything, but it's actually, to me, it says a lot. First of all, it's kind of empty. Um, where, where, is every, where is everyone? Like, where, where are the people walking in the streets? The idea of isolation makes a lot of sense. But also the idea of the institutionalization. And here's what's interesting. You know, if you look right here and right here and right here, you can see the foundations of old buildings that were there at some point in history. Who knows what it was? Some of them, I'm sure, were residential. If you go on 63rd Street, 63rd Street back in the 50s was a high density, as some of you know, a high density. You can find anything. I mean, there were small shops, but you can find anything. I mean, it's not sacks, but you can find groceries, and you can find a drugstore, and you can find a small clinic, and you can find a restaurant, and you can find a laundromat. Right? And we're talking about everyday resources that, regardless of your class background, you're going to want. Today, 63rd Street, you can stand on 63rd Street um, and st stand on one of the avenues and for five blocks straight see in a completely uninterrupted site because all of those buildings have been leveled. So Wilson's idea of, so talk about a beautiful picture, right? The idea, he was spot on. The idea of social isolation, the idea of this, the institutionalization, the deprivation of resources in high poverty neighbors make a lot of sense. And so you can imagine why when all of those students and researchers saw this. We thought, oh, it makes a lot of sense to think about poor neighborhoods, our neighborhoods in which this is what we see. But, 
But I've also studied poor neighborhoods in places other than Chicago. Remember, you study one, but then you go to another, and you go to another, and you see what you see, including a neighborhood that actually has the same poverty rate as Woodlawn, about 35% um, in New York City, which is Harlem. And so what does that look like? This is Harlem. 125th Street is the equivalent of 63rd Street, or what 63rd Street used to be. It's packed. You know, in case you think I'm making it up, you know that's Harlem because there's the Apollo. Sorry, pick this picture. <laughs> hey, I know you're Chicago grass, so you want to see the evidence. Um, it's interesting. It certainly does not look isolated, and it doesn't really look deinstitutionalized. In fact, if you go to Harlem, it's actually quite hard to find blocks that are empty blocks. You can find empty blocks in Woodland right now. That photo could have been from any of the last 25 years. But that's not a photo, of, but that's not the case in Harlem. In fact, when you go to Harlem, what you think about is not even is the opposite of isolation. You think overcrowding. You think, how am I going to get through this? When you think of deprivation, you say, well, actually, I can find a laundromat pretty easily. And I can find a chocolate center. And I can find a grocery store. And I, actually, I can find a lot of that stuff just literally just walking down the street. I don't have to do very much. It's actually quite easy to find. In fact, this is one of my favorite photos. This is a photo of a lot of us. Some of you might recognize the Lennox Lounge and so on, um, if you go to New York. Um, when you think about neighborhoods in New York, what you think is actually is a preponderance of everyday establishment. There's a bodega in every little corner in some of the ghettos in New York. There's a laundry in every other corner. Restaurants galore, and so on. So then I started thinking, well, OK, um, that's kind of what you see, right? So I did exactly what I just saw. I just went to the neighbors and said, what happens if you can look at the data a little bit more? What if you look at the demography of isolation, this idea of population density? Well, here it is. In Woodlawn, the population density is about 9,000 people per square mile, which it makes sense, it's like the woman with the thing and nobody around. In Harlem, it's about 85,000 per square mile. And actually, some of the census tracts in Harlem, it's about 135,000 per square mile. And it's a neighborhood that has exactly the same poverty rate. That's the key. Right, so this is the parts of Harlem that are still poor. Huh? So the parts that are associated with Jeffrey Canada Center and so on, not so much Morningside Heights and so on. Okay. What about safety, the violence issue that we've talked about? If you look at Woodlawn, what you're seeing here is the violent crime of robbery, aggravated assault, and rape. In the summer of 2013, we just got fresh data um, in Woodlawn and in Central Harlem. Woodlawn's in blue. What you're seeing is that in Woodlawn in that summer, um, the violent crime rate was about 325 uh, per 100,000 persons. So 325 robberies. In Central Harlem, it was less than half that. Aggravated assault, 325 more or less, three, close to 350. Harlem, it's less than half that. Rapes, about 40. Harlem, less than half that. What about the question of accessing resources, right? Did what we see while walking around actually square with reality? Here's where we're I'm conscious of ge geography of everyday experience, right? So if, if I plop you right now in Woodlawn, and I plop you right now in Harlem, how hard is it for you to just walk and find a pharmacy? Right? The simple, like, Everybody, or a restaurant, or a grocery store, or a gym, a community center, right? Some place where you can encounter others. In Woodlawn, there are about, I don't know, one or two pharmacies per square mile to walk a lot. In Harlem, there's about 35. Restaurants, I mean, you can see the data. Grocery stores, a little better, but not really. Gyms and community centers. In terms of the basic geography of it, you're going to have a much harder time in Woodlawn. What about, of course, if you go to economists, like, well, that's different from supply because there's more people in Harlem, so you could expect more of everything in Harlem. It's still important to look at the geography because the fact that there's a different rate doesn't mean it's any less hard for you to find something, but we look at it as well. This is really interesting. Here's the number of establishments per 100,000 persons in Woodlawn and in central Harlem. Woodlawn is actually undersupplied. So there's about 11 pharmacies per 100,000 people Whereas in Harlem, it's about 40. There are about, I don't know, eight restaurants per 100,000 people, uh, persons. In, in central Harlem, there are, I don't know, 65, 70, and so on in grocery and community store. Here's what's interesting. If you're going to generate the idea that social isolation and the institutionalization, the absence of resources, are characteristics of poor neighborhoods, Woodlawn is a perfect place to do so. Conversely, ah, 
if New York had had a great university with a lot of great urbanists, <laughs> in the general vicinity of Harlem, <laughs> our theories about what concentrated poverty does would have emphasized overcrowding and high density instead of isolation and in the institutionalization. And in case you think it's just a question of just two neighborhoods, which I wondered, it turns out that Woodlawn and Central Harlem actually reflect the differences between the cities as a whole in the characteristics of their high poverty neighborhoods. And I'm only gonna show you a couple of slides and then we'll move on to the bigger question. So in Chicago, for example, the high poverty neighborhoods only tend to have about 15, less, about 12,000, 12, 13,000 per square mile on average. In Harlem, they tend to have about 55, 60,000 per square mile, okay? If you look at homicides, which is easy uh, to get at the, at the city level, Chicago, yep, 16 homicides per 100,000 people, that's 2011. Uh, in New York City, about three per 100,000 people, and so on. But here's what's interesting. Okay, so you get this, and you, we began from the ground. I said, well, you look at one city, and then you look at another city. Okay, so now we looked at Harlem, and we looked at New York, and we're like, oh my goodness. At a minimum, I gotta ask a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> At least I hope you do. Uh, but then you're like, well, there's still two cities. They're among the largest cities in the country. What's actually happening in the country as a whole? But now notice, we're asking a very, very different kinds of questions because we began from the ground. If we hadn't begun from the ground, we wouldn't have been bothered asking this question because we'd have theorized the concentration of poverty effect that everybody had. So the two questions follow. So what, are, what do we think about the rest of the country empirically? And what do we make of social differences theoretically? Because at the end of the day, um, we want to be able to theorize and understand neighborhoods if we're going to do something on the policy side about them. So here's what happens in the in this country as a whole empirically. Here's what look, happens if you look at the question of low access and organizational data, density. Okay, what I want to show you now is really cool data. It's a technical term uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for data that's going to get you out of the morning. Really cool data. And so I will somewhat slowly walk you through the first slide because I'm then, I'm then going to show you a whole bunch of slides very quickly. But once you get the first, you'll realize why I took my time, and then I will go pretty quickly for them, and you'll get the big picture. Okay. What you're seeing here is I basically went to the, date, to the Department of Commerce, and we got data on the number of establishments in high poverty zip codes in the whole country. And then I said, well, what do they look like in poor neighborhoods? Because yeah, now I have a question. Now I want to see whether Harlem's the weird one or Woodland's the weird one, right? So <coughs> So here's what you see, <coughs> excuse me. What you're seeing in the items in bold are just a simple summation of the items right underneath, okay? And the numbers are the average number of establishments per 100,000 residents in high poverty neighborhoods, okay? So for example, if you look at hardware stores, what you're seeing here is that in Chicago poor neighborhoods, there are about three and a half hundred hardware stores per 100,000 residents. Now you know. Um, I'm sure you are dying to find out. By the way, these are small hardware stores, not Home Depots. We'll get to Home Depots in a minute. If you look at grocery stores, 3278, and so on down the list. Now, if you look at this number right here, small data there, what well, this 120 is, is just the sum of all of these. So I'm showing you all of the data, grocery stores, convenience stores, pharmacies, banks, credit unions, and so on, so that you can tell that I'm not making it up. But if you're willing to take your time and look at it, you'll see that you can read through the slides pretty quickly by just focusing on the items in bold. The picture's the same, okay? What I have at the bottom here, small medical establishments, small clinics, small dental clinics, the kind of stuff you'd have on 53rd Street, right? What you're seeing is uh, mental health physicians, physicians and so on, about 36 per 100,000 residents in the poor neighborhoods in Chicago. What you're seeing here, small recreational establishment. You saw the quote about movie theaters. Well, let's find out. There's movie theaters, there's uh, gyms and so on, there's bowling alleys. You saw the quote about bowling alleys. So we can find it. It's all an empirical question. Again, the items in bold, they're about 0.4 per 100,000 residents. If you look at small social establishments, they're about 100. Again, these are places where you can meet others because we care about isolation. Uh, religious organizations, restaurants, um, cafeterias, bookstores, childcare centers, etc. Places where you can just socialize. Again, here the question everybody asks, so here it goes. Uh, Home Depots, zero. And you're going to find that there's no Home Depots in poor neighborhoods anywhere, so it doesn't matter. But there it is. Because so <laughs> everybody always, what about Home Depots? So go, hey, here's the Home Depot. 
um, large grocery stores, this is the supermarket question, the food deserts question, what you see, ah, consistent. It's about uh, 0.7, three quarters of one per 100,000 residents in poor neighborhoods in Chicago. And these are large hospitals, they're about three. Okay, now you saw that. Now here comes the comparison. And I can go pretty quickly because you get the picture. Um, if you compare Chicago to the average American city, what you're seeing is that in Chicago, there's only 120 small establishments per 100,000. In the average American city, there's 220. There are more establishments in the average American city than in, the, than in Chicago, in the poor neighborhoods, in the average American city than in the poor neighborhoods in Chicago. If you look at small medical establishments, 104 to 36. If you look at small recreational establishments, 4 to 0.4, 10 times as many. If you look at small social establishments, 217 to 99. If you look at Home Depots, no story, there's no Home Depots anywhere <laughs> in poor neighborhoods. If you look at supermarkets, not that many, but almost twice as many. If you look at large hospitals, a little bit more, about one more large hospital on average. Okay, so that's Chicago and the average American city. What happens if you take the 10 largest cities in the US, right? Because it could be that the large cities are different. Or a big one, and I hope you're thinking about this, we're Rust Belt cities, because we all know that, well, we talked about the manufacturing sector, and the Rust Belt cities are the cities where, well, there were just a lot of manufacturing jobs and those jobs disappeared. Okay, if you look at the small day-to-day -day establishments, 180, so Chicago looks more like it, but Chicago is actually still towards the bottom of the distribution, even on that list. If you look at small medical, same story. Um, recreational, same story, right? You compare this and this. Small social, same story. Again, a little better, but still different. Nothing on Home Depot. I'll just tell you that last time, <laughs> zero. Um, food deserts, eh, there's a little something there. But Chicago is still more food desert-like than other poor neighborhood cities. Um, and in Los Hospitals, actually, Chicago is very similar. Finally, the Rust Belt story. The one where, you know, if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen in Rust Belt. Sorry. 120, 210 in the Rust Belt cities. I know, I know. I've had a lot of fun arguments with Bill Wilson over this paper. Um, small medical establishments, still. If you look at small recreational establishments, still. Small social establishments, look at that. Rust Belt cities, uh, nothing. Uh, large grocery stores, you know, a little closer, but still. And finally, large medical establishments. So that's the punchline, sort of. That's the first half of the punchline. Chicago is different. And if you're going to pick one city to create a generalizable theory of what's happening in American cities, <laughs> it's not exactly the very last city you want to pick. But I kind of wish there were great universities in other kinds of cities, too. <laughs> sort of. Um, one last point, and somebody's going to ask about this. You've all, so you live in D.C., you've been in New York, and you've seen Chicago. Chicago is spread out. There's no island. It's, there's no containment. And so, yes, poor neighborhoods are less densely, organizationally dense uh, than, non -poor, than, than poor neighborhoods in other cities. But all neighborhoods are probably, we would guess, less organizational dense in Chicago than in other neighborhoods. Now, the first story is still important because we're still getting the wrong picture, but it would give us some nuance if we thought that, well, Chicago poor neighborhoods are less dense, but when you compare poor to non-poor neighborhoods in Chicago, and you compare poor to non-poor neighborhoods in different cities, what you have is actually similar kinds of ratios. So I looked at that question. What you're seeing here is the number of establishments per 100,000 residents in poor neighborhoods minus the number in poor neighborhoods in the same city. And so if this sign is negative, what it's telling you is that the poor neighborhoods are less organizationally dense, consistent with the original Wilson theory. So what you're seeing here is that in Chicago, sure enough, there are 66 fewer small day-to-day -day establishments, and now you know what I mean by that, in the poor neighborhoods than in the non-poor neighborhoods per 100,000 residents on average. So, you know, it makes sense. In Chicago, the poorer in the neighborhood, the less there is. Small medical establishments, same story. Small social social stuff, it's actually positive, but it's so close to zero that you don't want to make too much of it. Small recreational establishments, again, negative, consistent with the story, but it's a little close to zero. Small social, yep, a lot less in Chicago poor neighborhoods than in Chicago non-poor neighborhoods. Surprise, surprise. Um, there just aren't that many Home Depots. But man, I, I promise you, if I'd remove this line, the first question, what about Home Depot? You know, and Walmart. 
Couldn't get Walmart data. Okay, large grocery stores. Okay, again, medical establishment. Actually, a little bit flipped. Which sort of makes sense if you think about it for a second. Now, if you look at the average American city, the opposite is true. I know. Now, before I walk through those data, some of you might, if especially if you either grew up in Chicago or went to college or graduate school in Chicago, you might say, well, how could that possibly be? How could it possibly be the case that there are more, that there's greater organizational density in a poor neighborhood than in the non-poor neighborhoods on average? If you step back again from the overwhelming framing device that is a powerful theory, and this was in fact a powerful theory by Wilson, you actually realize that doesn't, it's not that surprising in some respects. You've all heard of NIMBYism, the non in my backyard movement, for which middle and upper middle class residents tend to be much more successful at keeping not just Home Depot, but lots of kinds of establishments off of middle class neighborhoods. Rent is also cheaper in low income neighborhoods than in non low income neighborhoods. And for some kinds of establishments, everybody kind of needs a laundry. And it's more or less going to cost you the same to put the money in the laundry in a middle class neighborhood than in a poor neighborhood. There's a premium, right? You're gonna make a little more money, but possibly make a little more money, especially if there's that, that degree of demand that you saw in Chicago. In fact, if you, you've known New York, New York because uh, many of you, because we're so close to it, if you walk around Harlem, you'll see a lot, and I'm sure those pictures were familiar, but say you walk around the Upper East Side, it's actually very quiet, because they're very successful at keeping all of that crap out of their neighborhood, quote unquote, sorry. <laughs> Another technical term, along with cool and data, um, right? And so the idea is actually not that far-fetched if we think about the complexity of cities as they are lived, separate from an overarching master frame. A lot of that is what we're seeing here. So in the average American city, poor neighborhoods are actually more dense uh, in organizations, in small day-to-day -day establishments, small medical establishments, small social service establishments. Funny, in the recreational ones, we're a little like Chicago, but again, it's never as extreme. Small social establishments and so on. A little similarity there and so on. If you look at the 10 largest cities and the Rust Belt cities, the picture is actually very similar to the other one. Um, in other words, Chicago looks more like the 10 largest cities than like anything else. But even within the 10 largest cities, it's kind of, it's not an outlier, but it's a very much at one end of the distribution. You see 66, as is a lot more than 16. 78 is a lot more than 44, and so on. So what do we make of this? First thing. So we just describe Harlem. So is the model, well, if I'm poor, move to Harlem because there's everything and life is just wonderful. Well, no. Um, if you think about the consequences uh, of that concentration and the centrality of a place like Harlem, there's a couple of things. And I'm just showing you stylized facts. Um, of course, we can have a deeper discussion, but just to make sure we, we, uh, we keep the time. I think we're doing okay. Um, the median home values in Chicago and New York, you can imagine. Uh, this and this and this is why there, this is the reason why in poor neighborhoods everybody holds on to uh, to um, rent stabilized and rent controlled apartments like it's a lifeboat in the middle of the ocean, um, which is why there's a very large and aggressive argument about gentrification in New York. You've heard Spike Lee. Um, there's some in Chicago, but it's not the extent of the, the extent of anger is not the same. In fact, if we just do a kind of side eye comparison, the cost of living, of course, in New York is very high. Through gentrification moderate to high, whereas it's low to moderate in Chicago. Limitation of transport, that's actually a little better in New York. Wait list for resources, civil liberties complaints, <laughs> which, are, which were part of what accompanied those low crime rates. Um, very high in New York as opposed to Chicago. But I, I kind of a, a really simple and visceral one has to do with congestion. Having a lot of grocery stores and pharmacies and restaurants and so on on your street means that you have a lot of entities that have to be supplied on a regular basis which means you have a lot of diesel trucks in your neighborhood idling while the truckers are coming down. And there's quite a bit of research on this. Of course, it also means that there's more garbage. And if you've been in New York and you compared to Chicago, New York is filthy. Um, and more garbage means more rodents, uh, more mice. More rodents means more flakes from the skin of mice in the air, more particulates in the air, just like the diesel particulates and so on. I know it's kind of gross, but what it means is that it's not surprising to hear that in Harlem, about a quarter of all children uh, are reported to have asthma. Okay, so this is not a picture of good versus bad. This is a picture of what does it actually mean to live in a poor neighborhood when you are going to the ground, and what are the characteristics of the poor neighbors that we actually need to start paying attention to. Finding ways of reducing organizational or deinstitutionalization and isolation in places like Harlem 
And as you saw, in many of the poor neighborhoods in the country, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense. So what I'm arguing, what I'm arguing is not that we need a new theory for every single city. What, we are, what I'm arguing is that we ought to be theorizing from difference as opposed to from similarity. So I took a crack at it. I, we're just beginning, and then I'm going to wrap up in a second and open it up. So in Chicago, what is ghettoization in Chicago? Well, it means isolated neighborhoods, depopulated neighborhoods, institutionalized neighborhoods, high degree of racial clustering, and high violence. There are other cities that have that kind of isolation. Baltimore, for example, has a lot of these elements as well. The poor neighborhoods in, in Baltimore, as you know quite well. The poor neighborhoods in DC, probably not as extreme, but actually quite comparable to those as well. But there's also go ghettoization of other kinds. And this is the kind that you see, for example, in New York City, where high poverty means congestion. It means overcrowding as opposed to isolation. Low levels of racial clustering. And therefore, the threat of gentrification is an ongoing issue. And violence is not exactly, in part because of the threat of gentrification, that it is in places like Chicago. So we need new kinds of questions. For example, are low and high density two different kinds of ghettos? What happens when you probe deeper? How do we think about consequences, right? Does living in a poor neighborhood affect your life chances and make your life difficult? Well, the answer clearly has to be, at least in part, it depends whether you're in a poor neighborhood like the one in Chicago or in a poor neighborhood like the ones in Harlem, which is not the way we've asked that question, right? Second, how do we think about programs such as Moving to Opportunity in the Harlem Children's Zone? Um, somebody probably will ask about the Harlem Children's Zone, so I'll leave that one for a moment. But let's just say that New York is also unique in its own ways. And to the extent the Harlem Children's Zone works, it probably works in part because New York is a Harlem is a very special kind of poor neighborhood. So what do we need? What we need, I'm arguing, is a new set of models where we need a lot more data, right? It's a lot easier to do the, a, theory, a model, a, a proposal of the kind that Wilson did at the bigger picture. But once you realize, because you proceeded inductively, that there's a lot of important difference that's probably going to affect your life chances, you need a ton more data and a ton more new kinds of data. You need data on particulates. You need data on uh, on organizational density, you need data on, on threat identification, real estate prices, ticketing, civil liberties complaint, you're using a mass of data of the kind that we wouldn't even have imagined at the time that many of you were in graduate school. What's interesting is that we're now in a world where we're entering a phase where cities are collecting and publishing and making available those kinds of data. You've all heard of the phrase big data and all of the implications of it. Here's a case where it's actually very, very clear that Instead of me trying to go to every single poor neighborhood to get a big picture, the more data, I mean, I just, I didn't show you any regressions, I showed you simple descriptions. The more data of this kind I can use, the more I can understand the different ways that poverty clusters. Of course, to get those data and to make those data available for researchers, it's a lot harder for me to call the chief data officer in DC, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and so on, and creating, than to create institutions in which this is a natural part of the ongoing practice of the collaboration between or among cities, sometimes the private sector, and universities. And one of the things that actually I'm working on, I've been working on pretty passionately, is to create at the University of Chicago an institutional infrastructure that makes these kinds of connections possible. We actually have quite a few of these connections already with the city of Chicago, as I'm happy to talk to you in a minute if you care, but I think we need to do a lot more than that. I think not just the University of Chicago, I think the country as a whole, we ought to find ways of creating an institutional infrastructure so that the data that already exists can help us make a lot more informed policy decisions. Imagine, just, just step back for a second and think, you know, you hold a purse, and whatever your politics, whatever your politics, through whatever mechanism you want, it doesn't have to be a bunch of state government intervention, whatever your politics, you want to make it simpler for people in the low-income neighborhood, low-income neighbors, excuse me, to get out of poverty. If your picture is the dominant woodland picture, you're going to create a very different set of policies that are frankly going to cost you a lot of money. You're going to waste a lot of money. Then if your picture begins by saying, well, I know there's at least two very different models of what I would have to do. And there might be six or seven. We don't know yet. And the only way you're going to find out is by deploying the data that are now becoming available, but that weren't even possible as a way of understanding our theoretical thinking 20 years ago. Certainly not when Bill Wilson published the tool to vanish. In fact, those data I just showed you, the organizational density data at the zip code level, only became available for the first time in the 1990s. And that's like, you would think, right? You think like, if one country knows how many grocery stores there are everywhere, it should be the United States. Well, 
Turns out it was actually a lot harder to get those data in the past. So I'll leave you with that. How do we think about what is the answer to the core question? What's it like to live in a poor neighborhood and how does it affect your life chances? I think the only answer has to be it depends. But now we can find out how it depends. Whereas before, it was really difficult to find out how it depends. So with that, I'll thank you and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you.